Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Roland Thomas. I'm from the Data Science Engagement Group, um, and I'm going to be giving a little introduction um, today to uh, to Jupiter at NERSC. All right. Um, okay. So um, I'm not really sure whether or not everybody on the call is familiar with uh, what Jupiter is, but I thought I'd give a slide to kind of um, level set everybody. Uh, Jupyter is an interactive open source web application that allows you to create and share documents called notebooks. And these notebooks can contain live code, equations, visualizations, narrative text, uh, interactive widgets. Um, you can use Jupyter notebooks for uh, data cleaning, data transformation tasks, numerical simulation, statistical modeling, um, data viz, machine learning, workflows, and analytics frameworks. Um, Jupyter is extremely popular and it's becoming uh, ever more popular, especially in the data sciences. And we've noticed that um, obviously at NERSC amongst our user uh, base. Um, so um, basically, this is a slide that is. Um, that explains kind of why NERSC cares about Jupiter and what our engagement is. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, it's become an integral part of big data science, and um, especially it seems to be popular among um, users of uh, who are doing experimental and observational data science. So experiments like LSST Desk, DESI, um, user facilities like the ALS, LCLS, projects like Materials Project, and so on. Um, have workflows that are based around uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Um, we find that new users who are coming in, the I think it was mentioned earlier, something like almost half of our users are um, early career users come in and expect to be able to use Jupyter Notebooks at our facility. Um, so we need to be able to, to meet the needs there. Um, over the last um, four or five years, usage of Jupiter at NERSC has increased by about a factor of five. Um, and it seems to always be going up. So um, over the summer, we hit at least a thousand users uh, using Jupiter at NERSC per month. Um, and usage peaks generally over the summer when we have um, interns showing up and, and doing summer research projects. Um, this number, just in case you're interested, for comparison, about 3,000 users per month connect uh, to our supercomputers via SSH. So the number of users that use Jupyter is, is comparable to the same kind of order of magnitude as all of the users who SSH into, um, into one of our systems. Um, this slide shows that we've been engaged with the Jupyter project for um, about the last five to seven years, really. Um, I want to make it clear to everybody on, on the call that um, when I say engagement, what I mean is we actually work with the developers um, and we engage with the, the Jupyter developer community in order to um, make sure that we're able to meet the needs of, of users of Jupyter on our systems. Um, so this timeline kind of demonstrates different uh, milestones for us in the development of our deployment of Jupyter at NERSC. Um, so across the top, there's a list of of, of things that we've done with Jupyter over the years to kind of improve our ability to provide it as a stable service, um, but also to increase the capacity, uh, be able to, um, to serve more and more users and to expose new capabilities to them as new systems arrive. All right, so um, how do you actually use Jupyter at NERSC? Um, if you've used another computing facility, maybe one of the NSF facilities, you may be familiar with Open On Demand. That's one way that you can use Jupyter Notebooks um, on HPC systems. Another way is uh, Jupyter Hub, and we actually have a Jupyter Hub deployment at NERSC. Um, what that does is it redirects you to authenticate if needed. It's located at jupyter.nurse.gov, so you point your web browser there. If you're not already authenticated, um, say you haven't logged into Iris today or whatever, then you'll be redirected to authenticate. Then you can spawn a notebook server somewhere at NERSC, either Cori or, or Perlmutter. Um, the hub manages communication between you and your notebook. And it also manages the lifecycle of the notebook. So once you start the notebook server, um, it makes sure that it's running every five or 10 minutes or so. And then if you leave it idle for several hours, then it will shut it down for you. Um, 
It keeps, um, and uh, it also includes um, some helpful additional services. Um, if you've been to Jupyter recently, jupyter.nurse.gov recently, you may have noticed that there's a banner across the top mentioning that uh, Perlmutter um, is uh, having problems right now. Um, I think we mentioned earlier that there's some work going on to address some, some performance issues. Supercomputers are complicated. Um, but anyway, if there's any kind of degradation or um, performance issues that you may need to know about that, that may be posted uh, there on the hub. Okay, so um, again, at the bottom summary is you authenticate to the hub, then you choose where you wanna run a notebook and then you're redirected to your notebook once it starts up. How do you choose what notebook server you want to spawn? Well, it kind of depends on what kind of work you plan to do with your notebook. Um, as I mentioned, you can start a notebook on either Perlmutter or Cori. Most people start a notebook on a login node on one of those two systems. Um, an important thing to note is that on Perlmutter, um, if you click this button, um, the top left button, that's the Perlmutter shared CPU node. What that is, is that's actually a notebook server running on a login node. And since Perlmutter has about 40 login nodes, your notebook server is going to be started up on one of those. You'll be running alongside other users who are either SSH in or running Jupyter Notebooks themselves. From there, you can see uh, the community file system, uh, your home directory. You can see the Perlmutter scratch directory. It's got the same Python environment as you would get if you did module load Python um, uh, from SSH. And you can also submit uh, batch jobs even if you want to using the terminal there or um, using a uh, um, magic command uh, like sbatch. On Cori, all of the notebook servers that uh, get started up on the login nodes are actually just restricted to four login nodes. Okay, so is probably a better idea these days for you to start up a Jupyter Notebook server on a Perlmutter login node and not on a Cori login node. Um, before the talk here, I just went and counted them up. Um, there's about 300 notebook servers running right now on Cori that are crammed into those four nodes. And there's about a hundred running on Cori login nodes spread out all, all over those 40 login nodes. So it's, it's probably better for you to, to, to get onto to Perlmutter with Jupyter. Um, on Cori, uh, like I mentioned, it's you're kind of crammed into those four nodes. You can see uh, the same um, CFS and home directories. You can see Cori Scratch. You cannot see Perlmutter Scratch from Cori and vice versa. Um, same Python environment as uh, as SSH login on on Cori uh, as module in Python. Um, there are some other options as well. Um, if you want to be able to run, say, a deep learning um, a deep learning workflow using a Jupyter Notebook uh, with four GPUs or something like that, you can run a Jupyter Notebook in a batch job. Um, basically, you push one of the other buttons. Um, if you want to be able to run a notebook on a compute node that doesn't have any GPUs, it's just a regular CPU, you can press the exclusive CPU node button. Um, the configurable uh, jobs on the far right of the interface allow you to configure uh, the job parameters in case you need, say, more than one node, or you want to change uh, what the layout is for, for scheduling the steps for individual jobs. Um, there's also, um, you might also see buttons for Cori GPU nodes. You may or may not see those. It depends on whether or not you've been, um, you, you have access to the, the QoS for that. Um, <clears throat> but these days, everybody should probably be getting onto Perlmutter and using um, the GPU nodes there. Uh, final thing to remember is that the shared notebook server options mean that you're running alongside other users. Um, and so generally we do um, we do things to keep users from colliding with each other, but sometimes users can do a lot of IO and that can affect um, that can affect other users on the same node. So we we do ask that people observe the guidelines for good behavior on login nodes. Um, I wanted to show a couple of goodies that we have installed in our Jupyter Lab deployment. Um, one of them is um, a list of favorite locations that you can manage on our file system. 
uh, HPC file system is a big, gigantic, hierarchical place where it can be easy to get lost, especially if you're kind of clicking around in, in, in the Jupyter Lab interface. Um, so we actually created this favorites plugin that um, allows you to bookmark favorite places on the file system. And it's pre-populated with your home directory, um, scratch directories. Um, and you can, um, you can add the current directory that you're in to the list of favorites by clicking um, the star icon there. Um, another goodie that we've got is the list of recent um, locations, uh, places that you've been recently on the file system that can be handy for, again, navigating the file system, which can be kind of challenging through a UI like this. Um, and also we've, we've added a feature, I think we got this upstreamed into the um, Jupyter Lab core, which is the ability to open any file um, using the open from path uh, element of the file menu. All right, so um, once you're running Jupyter Lab, how do you actually compute? Um, in order to compute, what you need to use is a process called a kernel, which is already an overloaded term, of course. But basically, it's just a Python interpreter or some other process that the notebook server starts up on your behalf that manages compute for you and keeps state and things like that. So um, this diagram um, depicts uh, you on the left with a smiley face operating your web browser on your laptop. Um, and that's connected to a notebook server that's running, say, on Perlmutter, um, say, a Perlmutter login node. So that's the, the green box that says notebook server. And attached to that is um, a kernel process. Um, generally, that'll probably be a Python interpreter that's, that's running. And it's communicating, the notebook server is communicating with the kernel. Um, the notebook server is responsible for taking care of your actual notebook itself, okay? So the question is, um, if you want that kernel process to be doing something kind of custom, how do, you, how, do you, how do you get your own kernel set up? Normally, if you could run our kernel, which is just a Python interpreter that you get from um, module load Python, but what if you have your own set of packages that you want to use? That turns out to be kind of the most common question that we get which is how do I take a Conda environment that Daniel just talked about in the previous talk and use that from Jupyter. There's a few different ways to do this. Um, here's the easy one, uh, which is uh, to activate the environment, make sure that you've added the IPy kernel package to that. Um, and then once you have done that, run the command shown at the, uh, at the bottom of the listing here on this slide, Python dash M IPy kernel install and so on. What that does is that creates a kernel spec file and then when you um, bring up Jupyter, uh, you may need to either restart the notebook server or just reload the page, actually. Um, you should see your kernel listed there um, on, the, on the kernel launcher in Jupyter Lab. What's actually in the kernel spec file, um, when you create the kernel spec, it actually nicely, it tells you exactly where it put it. So you can just go look at it. It's a JSON file that basically just is, how do I run this command? So the, the notebook server is going to run the stuff that's in the argv array that's listed there. And then there's a little bit of metadata after that. Um, you really don't need to mess with this generally too much um, unless you want to do further customization besides just making sure that you have the packet, your favorite packages available in your, in your kernel. Things like environment variables can be added to, um, to the JSON here, and you would do that by hand. Um, but that can be kind of... Um, uh, inconvenient because you can't use semantics, like you can't extend a path, the path variable. You can't concatenate the path like you do um, in a shell, like in a shell script. So another way that you can manage this kind of customization is actually just by having, having it run a shell script for you when it starts a kernel. And so we call this a helper um, script. This is documented um, in great detail on the, on the NERSC website on, on Jupyter. Um, basically, what you do is you just delegate everything that you want to happen when it's time to run your kernel to the to the shell script, like set up some environment variables, load some module, and then start uh, the Python process. Um, and you can kind of mix and match this with uh, all kinds of different modules and, and variables. Um, you can also um, create a kernel based off of a shifter container. Uh, Lori's going to talk about shifter next. 
Um, but here it's basically, again, you just tell uh, Jupyter how to run the process that you want to run inside the kernel spec file. This is also documented on the NERSC website uh, as well. I have a couple final pointers about um, debugging things. Uh, if you're having trouble setting up uh, a kernel spec or something like that, uh, how do you figure out what's going wrong with it? Uh, the interface will probably just show you that your that your kernel doesn't start or something like that. Um, everybody gets um, a log file that um, uh, captures the output from the Jupyter Notebook server when you run it on either machine. And the name of this log file is, it's in your home directory, it's .jupyter machine name log. So on Cori, it's .jupyter Cori log. And on Perlmutter, it's .jupyter log. And you can um, open this file up and you can usually see error messages or warnings or information that might tell you what's going wrong with your setup. And uh, you know, if you have trouble and, and you, you know, you can't uh, figure out exactly what's going on from your from your log file, you can you can let us know you took a look at your log file and um, didn't, you know, didn't see information that told you how you could debug it yourself and we can take a look at it for you um, and try to help get you back on your way. But I'd say before you before you open up uh, the interface to start filing a ticket, you might want to just take a look at this log file and see if there's anything there that might be a clue. Uh, that helps you uh, debug your Jupyter environment. Okay, so this is um, this is my last slide. I'm not sure if I'm ahead or 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 behind here. Actually, I'm a little bit ahead. Um, but ba but the basics here are: if you want to use Jupyter at NERSC, you just take a web browser and point it at jupyter.nurse.gov. You can customize your Jupyter experience at NERSC using a kernel spec. Uh, with a conda environment, so you can have whatever package it is, packages it is that you want to use from a Jupyter notebook. Um, you can customize those kernel spec files in many different ways. You can use, um, you can add environment variables, you can add modules, you can even use a shifter container if you like, and all of that's documented on the Jupyter at NERSC um, documentation page. And I just wanted to also mention that we're always looking for ways um, to help our users use Jupyter for in for in new ways. Um, so please, if you have feedback or advice, or you figured out how to solve a problem and you want to share it with us, please go ahead and 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 just let us know by ticket, or you can you can even email me. Okay. So I think that's I think that's everything that I've got.